I, I have a confession to make. That is the greatest movie ever made. And I believe that with my whole heart. Any Lion King fans? All right. I, it's such a powerful movie that tells this incredible story. By the way, I'm Mike, Mike Foster, on the teaching team here. And uh, I love that movie because we get to watch this character named Simba, this, this little lion, become and discover who he really is. And all the doubts and all the confusion and all the, the struggle uh, of that process. And, and today I wanna, I wanna talk about the Lion King, but, but more important, I wanna talk about uh, who we're becoming and the, the very thing that stands in the way of that. And so we're gonna talk about a really kind of light-hearted topic. Uh, we're gonna talk about shame today, okay? Um, some of you are reaching for your purses and your car keys, and you're like, I'm out of here. Go into an early breakfast, because I don't wanna talk about shame. That sounds really heavy. And I'm just gonna put this out there. This might be my most unfunny message I've ever given. And some of you are thinking, well, Mike, you've never given a funny message. Uh, you're not very funny. This is, this is kind of some, some serious stuff, some stuff that I, I've been praying about this message all week because I'm so hopeful that in our time together that, that maybe a little light bulb would come on inside of your heart and inside of your soul and that you would be able to see some things that maybe you haven't seen before and begin to test some of your conclusions about who you are, and that maybe you would be able to see the king inside of you, just like Simba struggled for so long to, to know who he really was, that, that maybe for you today, you could step into this, this beautiful um, identity of being God's son and daughter, his beloved and that we live from this place of, of worthiness, that we live from this place where we, we know who we are instead of running away. And, and, I, and I love the, the movie, uh, The Lion King, because I think it so perfectly demonstrates kind of life, that there's things that happen in our life. For Simba, it was the death of his father and feeling responsible for that. And so he ran away because he felt shame. He felt horrible for that. He felt like he, life could never be the same for him again because of what he thought he had done. And so he ran off to uh, another place, another land. And you know he met Pumbaa and Timon and sang Hakuna Matata, and that was great for him. But it wasn't his rightful place in the kingdom, was it? And uh, I think there's some of us living today in, not in our rightful place in the kingdom because of some lie that we believe, something that has happened in our story that has caused us to run. And running is a, is a very common thing in the human condition, isn't it? We go back to Genesis 3 and we look at the story of Adam and Eve and we see uh, two people who experience shame, who have something go terribly, terribly wrong in their story. They make a terrible, terrible decision to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the very tree that God had commanded them not to eat from, and they did it. And we pick it up here in Genesis 3. It says this. It says, then the eyes of both of them, Adam and Eve, were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Isn't that what we do when we, we feel shame, when we feel like we made a mistake, when we, we feel like, like we, we've made a really horrible choice? What do we do? We just cover it up, right? And, and then the, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It goes on to say, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, 
where are you? God's asking, where are you guys? Why are you running? Why are you hiding? And uh, Adam answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Goes on to say, uh, and, he, and God says, who told you that? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And so here we have two people struggling with shame. I, I, to me, shame is one of the most destructive barriers between us and God. It causes us to run and hide from the very person that can save us and rescue us. It is the very solution that sits over here and yet shame tells you to run away. Just like Scar, I don't know if you remember this scene but in the movie, but, but there's this, this scene where Mufasa is dead and he got trampled by all the wildebeests in this valley and uh, Scar is plotting to take over uh, the kingdom and so he wants to get rid of Mufasa and he's gotta get rid of Simba some way. And so Simba is there, he sees Mufasa, Mufasa is dead and Simba feels responsible for Mufasa's death, right? And Scar in his evil plot, in his evil ways, comes over and, and he looks at Simba in just sort of disgust. And he's horrified knowing that Scar was the one responsible for all of it. And he looks at Simba and he goes, Simba, what, what have you done? What, what, you killed Mufasa. And then what does Scar tell Simba to do? But to run, run away, go away because of this failure, because of what you've done, because you killed Mofasa, run, run, run. Sound familiar? Run and hide. Here's what I know is that the enemy tells us to run, run away. But Jesus says, run, run to me. That's where we go when we have failed, when we have made mistakes, when we're struggling with shame, when we made poor choices, when we're hurting, when we're suffering, run, run to Jesus, not run, run away. The enemy also says this. The enemy says, shame on you for what you did. You killed Mufasa. You got that divorce. You have that addiction. You have that secret. Shame on you. But you know what Jesus says? Jesus says, shame off of you. I wanna release you from that. I wanna give you a new life and, a, and I wanna forgive you. And I want you to experience my radical grace like you've never experienced it before. That's the message of the gospel. That's what Jesus is telling us is you don't have to be defined by your shame anymore. You don't have to listen to that voice that tells you to run, run away, go hide, go cover yourself. Jesus says, you don't have to worry about any of that. You just lean in to my love, lean in to my grace. Shame off of you, not shame on you. And for a lot of us, we have to think about our lives and our stories and the things that we believe about ourselves. And we have, to, we have to sort of like be a detective or an investigator. We have to look and say, like, who storied that for you? Who gave you that story? Just like Scar gave Simba a story that said, it's your fault, so run away. I imagine there's, there's conclusions that you've come to about your life and about your story and your relationship with God and your relationships with other people that there's something or someone who storied something for you. It told you something that just flatly was not true. Now, let me, let me share something from my own story. Now, I, I've shared the, uh, this piece of my story before, but, but early on in my childhood, there was sexual abuse. And uh, a family friend took advantage of me as a kid, and uh, it, it just it created this whirlwind inside of my heart. And I was so, so confused. There was secrets, there was shame, 
There was denial. There's just all this junk, this sticky, gooey, yucky shame in my heart. And, and because of that event, because of that, that trauma, because of that moment in my story, I believe certain things about who I was or what I was supposed to do. I, I mean, I ran as fast as I could from that moment. I wanted to get as far away from that story just like Simba did, right? He ran away from the, the place that he, he uh, experienced that, that death of his father. And, and so I, something was storied to me, something was told to me about who I was and my worth and my value and who's safe and who's not safe. And it got corrupted and shame snuck into that moment. I think for some of us, our stories are loaded up with shame, not necessarily even because of an event, but maybe something that you heard from somebody. And I, I, a lot of times, shame is, is put on us by other people. And unfortunately, sometimes shame and condemnation is put on us by people who stand on a stage like this and use the gospel and use religion and use the Bible to make us feel less than to define us by our unworthiness, your wicked heart, your horribleness, your sin. When God's saying like, I, I get it. Yes, we're all messy. We're all have brokenness in our stories, but, but you're my son and daughter. You, are, you need to operate as if you belong in the kingdom. That's who you are. And I think a lot of us believe a theology and, and read a Bible that, that's not true. And that's not correct. Let me, let me do a little drawing here to explain. I think a lot of us, there's, there's kind of two different Bibles. And, and to me, the Bible is a love story from God to you and me. It's telling us how much he loves you, how much he wants relationship with you, that he's not disappointed in you, that he desires for you to be a part of his family. And, and so I think we have two Bibles. We have number one, the, what I call the religious Bible. And the religious Bible looks like this. It reads from Genesis 3 to Revelation 20. And um, it's the fall, Genesis 3, and then the judgment in Revelation 20. And the problem, a lot of us read this story and a lot of us have been taught this story. Our whole theology is based on this foundation of this religious Bible. And here's the problem with this story. This is, uh, let's just call this bad news to bad news story, right? That's what we get here. Bad news to bad news. But guys, this isn't the Bible. This is the religious Bible. This is some, some, for some of us who grew up in the church or may have been in certain uh, churches, this is what we have been taught. But the, the actual Bible, let's talk about the actual Bible, looks like this. Look at Mike Foster getting all theology, theological on you guys. Oh my gosh. I'm just supposed to draw little fancy little doodles, not actually talk about the Bible here. Oh my gosh, look at me. Um, the actual Bible is what? Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And Genesis 1 is the creation of heaven and earth. Right? And Revelation 22 is the reunion of heaven and earth. This is the actual Bible. And you know what I look at this story? This is a good news story. From good news to good news. And I'll tell you, like, I grew up in the church. I went to church every Sunday with my family. I went to Sunday school. I went to midweek Bible study. I went to vacation Bible school. I was fully indoctrinated. But I gotta be honest. I actually got the religious Bible instead of the actual Bible. And so a lot of us have this experience, right? Where you come to church and, and you don't, you're not told who you really are. You're, you're, you're told that you're, 
you're horrible and you're deceitful and, and we're here to, like, as pastors, we're here to fix you. Let me just, let me just be real honest here. The reason why that religious Bible works, I'm probably getting in trouble for saying this, but the reason why that religious Bible works and the message of shame and condemnation works is because the person who's giving that message of shame and condemnation can now control you. It's about control, using fear to control you. And, and here's why, if, if you are a horrible person, if you're a sinner, if you're broken, if you're full of shame, you gotta keep coming to me because I'm gonna fix you. You need my teachings, you need my messages. Oh my gosh, Mike, you're, wait, you're going, wait, get off that soapbox, Foster. I am just telling you, that is used as a weapon against you instead of what Jesus offers in the story of the Bible is a message of freedom. See, you'll never hear a message of condemnation from this stage. I promise you that is not the heart of Jared or myself or anybody that stands on this stage. We want you to know that you are loved by God. We want you to know that forgiveness is there for you if you'll receive it. We want you to come into relationship with God's grace. We're not here to put shame on you. We're not here to condemn you. We're not here to make you feel less than. So what is shame. Let's talk about that. Give some different definitions because my guess is some of you walk in, walked into this building or maybe have been sitting in the seats right now and going, this doesn't apply to me. I'm all good, feeling good about myself. Well, let's unpack this a little bit. So shame. Shame is an intense belief that we are flawed and unworthy of love. Again, a lot of times we, we learn these messages through trauma or rejection, uh, through some difficult season. Some, sometimes it's because we, we, we had a, uh, a certain season of our life where we were just, our life was out of control and we made really poor choices. And, and, and so we feel that we are unworthy of love, forever flawed, forever broken, no hope for us. Shame is also the dark repeating voice that tells you that you don't measure up, so do more. Some of you are so driven by performance and success that you're, you're striving and reaching for something. And you just think from the, from the superficial level, you think like, oh, I'm just trying to provide for my family. I'm just trying to, you know, make a living. But underneath that is sitting there this idea that you're not enough, so do more. Work harder, drive yourself, drive, 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 go, go, go. What is underneath? Shame. It's feeling that I'm not enough, so I have to do more. Shame is also a corrosive spiritual acid that soaks your soul in perfectionism, performance, rage, and legalistic religion. Now, let me, let me just take a moment here and talk to the men in the, the audience. Women, you don't have to listen to this. Men, most of us don't identify with the word shame. Most of us go, nah, I'm good. I'm uh, fine. You know, yeah, I got some problems, but it's, it's not shame. That's too, uh, too loaded of a word. Let me tell you, if you are struggling with anger, in volcanic rage, that is shame bubbling underneath the surface that is popping out of you, okay? That's the sign that there's something inside of your heart that God wants to heal. That means that you have come to certain conclusions, men, about your life and your value and who you are that needs to be dealt with. So shame, it is, it's there and, and we need to look at it. It's so hard to look at it, but here's why we gotta look at it. Proverbs four says this. So above all, guard the affections of your heart for the effect all that you are. Pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being for from there flows the wellspring of life. You see, if we don't do that deep work, if we don't 
ask God to say, shine a light on the stuff inside of me. If we don't pay attention to that rage and that anger and that perfectionism and that performance and that legalistic religion that we love, if we don't pay attention to that stuff, we're compromising our entire life because out of the heart flows the wellspring of life and out of the heart is gonna flow either the wellspring of life or the wellspring of death. Your choice. I don't need to get personal, but for some of you, this isn't just, just a sermon today. This is going to be an intervention, right? There's stuff that we just have failed to look at and failed to deal with because we've been afraid. Here's the deal. Um, you're, not, you're not actually broken. A lot of people tell you that. I think a lot of... Uh, Church people love to tell you that you're broken, you're lost, you're a failure, you're cooked, you're done, you're, you're hopeless. I get it. That message is pounded into our heads and into our hearts over and over again, but you're not broken, you are covered. You are covered with shame. You're making your very own Adam and Eve fig leaf gar garment. You're covering yourself with all of this, this stuff. And, and, and God says, I want to heal you. I want to truly set you free. I think it often looks like this, our stories. I brought myself here a big teddy bear, right? And, and the reason why we have a big teddy bear instead of a big lion is because the lion was like 200 bucks. And I'm like, that's too much, <laughs> all right? So we got a bear, but here we got... You gonna stay there? All right. By the way, I begged, I begged them to let me take this home with me. My wife's in Africa for two weeks on a missionary trip and I need somebody to snuggle with. So I'm gonna take this home with me. Um, so we have here, this is going to represent your original self, your true self. You're born, you're created, you're, you're lovely, you're beautiful, you're worthy. This God created you, this is your original self. And then you start living your life and you come across some different moments of your life that are traumatic or hurtful. And, and maybe, uh, maybe somebody says something really mean to you uh, at school and they, they say you're fat or you're ugly. And, and all of a sudden you, you feel, feel less than and you're, you're covered up a little bit in shame. It's a layer of shame on your life. Or maybe you tell that, that girl in high school uh, that you're in love with her and you just want to go out with her and ask her out on a date and she goes, I would never date you. And there's another layer of shame. Or maybe perhaps uh, you were bullied. Somebody just pushed you around and you were afraid and all of, all, you didn't feel like you were included or fit in. And so there's this other layer of shame put on you. Or maybe even in your adult life, maybe you got fired from a job or had a financial crisis and you, didn't, you weren't able to figure it out and had to file for bankruptcy. Or again, maybe there's some re broken relationship that, that's your, your fault and your responsibility and it's because of your choices it ended. And then... There's this other layer of shame put over you. What's happened here? We've lost the bear. We lost the, the original self. We lost that beautiful creature that is underneath all of these layers of shame. And this is what our lives look like. You are covered in it. And so what do we do? We look at this picture and we go, oh, I don't like that at all. I wanna get away from that. People aren't gonna like this. So what do we do? We set up another version of ourselves. I sit over here and I create what I call my false self. I call it Hollywood Mike. And Hollywood Mike is produced by Mike Foster himself. Executive producer, director, cinematographer, all controlled by me. And I create, you know, I, I perform. I do what people want me to do. I'm a people pleaser. I, I say what people want me to say so they'll love me and welcome me. And, and I get a lot of praise for this. I get a lot of attention for this. People like this version of me. And, and so any praise and any adoration or any success, I all put it on this false self Hollywood version of Mike. 
and anything that goes wrong in my life, any of my brokenness or any of that, that stuff, I just throw it back onto to this guy over here. More shame, that goes over there. And so what do we do? What do we need to do? We need to allow God to uncover and forgive and redeem and to remind us who we truly are so we can get back to this beautiful bear that's always been there. See, I believe this original self, this true self is indestructible. It's there inside of you and it's there inside of me and God is just wanting to release it and uncover it and heal it and set it free. So how do we, how we do that? Well, let me just say this. Here, here's something to remember. Just because uh, you have carried this for so long, have done this whole thing, carried shame and new self, just because you've, you've carried all of this in your life, uh, doesn't mean it isn't heavy. And if you're exhausted, if you're tired, if you're out of breath by life, it's because you have carried it for too long. And Jesus says, if you put that at the foot of the cross, if you trust me with that, if you allow me to begin to do the work to, to go back to your original self, life will get lighter. <laughs> it will. Uh, so how do we transform the shame? Real quickly, three th quick things. Number one is recovery. So recovery, recovery of our emotions and feelings. We stop the numbing. You see, how do we deal with this mess? How do we deal with this madness? How do we deal with this trying to live two lives and true self and false self and Hollywood Mike and shameful Mike? How do we do that? We just numb. We shut our heart down. So I'm inviting you to feel again, to feel anger, to feel sadness, to feel joy. Stop crushing those feelings and stop numbing and medicating and turning to a bottle or turning to drugs or turning to social media or turning to binge eating or whatever we're doing to medicate and numb the, the pain that we're in and we begin to recover our emotions and our feelings. Number two, it's uncovery. We hand the shame back take all that stuff that was on top of us and we hand it back. And we hand it by, back by asking ourselves a few questions. Number one, we gotta, we gotta look at our story and go, how did the shame get there? How did that belief, how did that value, how did that conclusion about my life actually get there? Who told me that? Who said that? Who was my scar? Who was my, my, my serpent in the, the garden? Who, who told me that? Who's telling me to run away? Then we gotta look at the facts and say, what is true here and what is a lie? You know, one of the things that we need to do as healthy adults and as adults is to look back at our story and, and what, as children, as, when we're younger, adolescents, even in our 20s, we, we believe certain things about our story and who we were and we came to conclusions that a child would come to. But as healthy adults, we need to look back and challenge those conclusions. We need to ask ourselves like, how, what, why did I believe, what is actually true about this event? I had to do that work in terms of the, the uh, sexual abuse. I had to look at that because I came to a lot of poor conclusions about who I was and my value and worth. I, I took the blame for what happened to me. And it wasn't until I did that work as a healthy adult and I could look back and say, like, is that true? Is it my fault? No, of course not. You too, you need to do the same thing about some of the, the things in your life what needs to be questioned? What, who do you need to give the shame back to? Because again, it was given to you and you can give it right back. And by the way, that, that's to me one of the most hopeful messages I've ever heard in my entire life. The fact that I don't have to carry this anymore. It's not mine, it never was. I can give it back to that person. I can give it back to that event. Or how about this? I give it to God. You carry it, God. All right, so uncovery. And the last step is this discovery. Find out who you really are. Why don't you begin to dig in to the actual Bible? Why don't you begin to ask God to reveal things inside of you that are true and not a lie? Why don't you allow Jesus to write the story instead of letting shame write the story? There's this uh, uh, thing that I read about Michelangelo and Michelangelo crafted this, probably one of the most stunning pieces of art ever uh, in his statue of David. 
And many of you have seen this and you remember this because he's naked, right? Uh, it's like, oh my gosh, he's fully naked. And he's there and, and Michelangelo is a, a master. He was an incredible artist. And um, some, the, the story goes that somebody asked him about this statue of David and, and how do you do that? Like you start with this gigantic piece of marble and how do you create David out of that? And Michelangelo said, all I did was chip away everything that didn't look like David. That's the work, my friends. That's what I'm asking you to do. In partnership with God, why don't we chip away everything that doesn't look like you? Everything that doesn't belong to you. Why don't we chip away at the lies that we have come to believe about ourselves and truly experience the radical grace of God to experience this amazing life that we can have with him. Chip away, be brave, be courageous, get that shame off of you so you can live. Let's bow our heads in prayer. God, thank you so much for who you are. God, for making us who we are. And God, may we anchor our lives in your love. May we understand who we are and that we don't have to run away. And we don't have to feel like our life is forever broke. We don't have to feel like a failure. We don't have to feel like we've disappointed you, God. We just come to understand like a child, just the simple message that you're trying to tell us that we are loved. Jesus, forgive us. Forgive us of our sins, but also forgive us for believing our lies. And God, may we live with you, courageous, bold, fully ourselves. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen.